Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. In the last two videos, the analysis of various star types resumed and then we moved to the white dwarf. To recap, ideal gases cannot undergo gravitational collapse. Gases expand to fill the void and possess a positive heat capacity. Alternatively, if gases are not ideal, then weak forces between the particles can come into play. Gases thereby condense to form liquids and solids, and they do not gravitationally collapse. Consequently, there is no means to form gaseous stars and highly compressed objects from purely gaseous nebular clouds. In the second video, Eddington's famous mass luminosity equation was presented because it was through this equation that stars became viewed as ideal gases. The mass luminosity equation is thermodynamically invalid as it renders temperature in Stefan's law non-intensive. Still, using his equation, Eddington concluded that the poor luminosity of white dwarfs could only be explained by lowering their radius. As a result, he argued for the existence of incredibly dense objects. He completely ignored the possibility that white dwarfs could possess different lattice structure at the level of the photosphere. That is a much more reasonable explanation to account for their lowered emissivity. A hydrogen-based star with a diamond-like photospheric lattice would be expected to have lower luminosity than a main sequence star with a hexagonal planar photospheric lattice as we saw in this video. However, Eddington's theory did not end with the derivation of the mass luminosity equation. He also invoked general relativity and the fact that spectroscopic lines in the white dwarf should be gravitationally shifted if stars were indeed tremendously dense. It has been proposed that gravitational redshifts can be linked to the mass and the radius of a star using this expression. Where g is the universal constant of gravitation, c is the speed of light, r is the radius in meters, and m is the mass of the star in kilograms. This expression is often found expressed in terms of solar mass and solar radius as follows. Where m in this case is the ratio of the mass of the star to the mass of the sun, and r is the ratio of the star's radius to the radius of the sun. Some white dwarfs are part of a binary system, as is the case for Sirius b. For these dwarfs, the mass can be accurately measured using orbital dynamics and the laws of motion. At the same time, using Eddington's ideas relative to mass luminosity, the radius of a white dwarf can be obtained from this expression, where F sub V is the luminous flux observed at the top of the Earth's atmosphere, H sub V is the theoretical Eddington flux for the star, R is the radius, and D is the distance to the star. Of course, this expression assumes that the emissivity of the white dwarf is equal to 1. In addition, the mass and radius of the white dwarf can be obtained from fitting model atmospheres, wherein the effective temperature of the dwarf's photosphere and the surface gravity of the star are estimated from the shape of the spectral lines. We will not discuss this approach as it is based on far too many assumptions, none of which can be practically measured including dismissal that chemical coordination could be altering both line shapes and shifts. For those who are interested in the problem, here is a key reference relative to white dwarfs. From Somon et al., we learn that 18,000 white dwarfs have been fitted to models. Moreover, to date, more than 20,000 white dwarfs have been analyzed using a combination of the gravitational redshift expression, the Eddington-based expressions for luminosity, and model atmospheres, as one can gather in this paper. In addition, more than 350,000 white dwarf candidates have now been identified through Gaia parallax measurements. Of course, all these identifications are based on the presence of a reduced luminosity and the assumption that the emissivity of each star remained equal to 1, therefore making the stars hyperdense. In any event, Astronomers have assumed that all spectroscopic line broadening and shifts on the stars are due only to gravity and have discounted the effect of coordination chemistry, which is known to result in line broadening and shifts in the laboratory. Unfortunately for astrophysics, chemistry can render all their gravitational redshift measurements completely invalid. It is well known that chemical coordination can alter the line width and shifts of an atom, even at pressures of less than 10 torr, as one can gather in this paper. 
As we will now learn, beyond coordination chemistry, there is already serious cause for concern relative to the use of selective hydrogen lines to obtain the desired redshifts. If we are to take gravitational redshift arguments seriously, then all hydrogen lines must give the same redshift. The same must be said for all metallic lines which are associated with the spectrum of a white dwarf. Consequently, it is good to review what has transpired relative to the claim that spectroscopic lines are gravitationally shifted in the white dwarf. I have decided to examine the question primarily by focusing on Sirius B. After the last video, everyone should be familiar with this white dwarf. Remember also that its gravitational redshift was the source of Eddington's confidence in the mass luminosity expression. If you are interested in Sirius B, Professor Hallberg has produced this wonderful text on the Sirius system and has also produced this paper on the early history of gravitational redshift measurements of Sirius B. In Chapter 9 of his book, Hallberg outlined how Eddington reached out to Walter Adams of the Mount Wilson Observatory to measure the redshift of Sirius B. The letters exchanged between the two have been reprinted in their entirety in the aforementioned paper. The problem was that Eddington informed Adams in advance of his expectations. He claimed that the redshift of Sirius B would be about 28.5 kilometers per second. Adams would end up measuring 23 kilometers per second, arguing that the redshift from the hydrogen beta line was more reliable than from the hydrogen gamma line, which had an average redshift of only 10 kilometers per second. According to values accepted today, Adams was off by a factor of 4 for hydrogen beta and a factor of 8 for hydrogen gamma. In fact, given the accuracy of his measurements, a redshift of 10 km per second for hydrogen gamma was actually indistinguishable from zero. To further highlight the magnitude of his errors, it is important to recall that Adams' data was polluted with magnesium, iron, and titanium ion lines originating from Sirius A. He reported an average redshift of 20 km per second for the magnesium ion. But this ion should have had a redshift of nearly 0 km per second since it was coming from Sirius A. The titanium ion had an average redshift of only 4 km per second. These facts are not sufficiently exposed in Holberg's book or paper. Some astronomers excuse Adams' measurement, claiming that he had failed to recognize the pollution from Sirius A. That is not true. In fact, he argued that the hydrogen gamma line was more a product of Sirius A than the hydrogen beta line. In any case, a careful scientist would have highlighted that there were significant signs of error in this paper, and given the stakes involved, it should have simply been rejected. Both the titanium ion line and the hydrogen gamma lines were giving warning signs of error. Remember that because of this measurement, for at least 40 years, white dwarfs became viewed as extremely dense without any actual supporting evidence. Even worse, after Eddington heard of the result, he adjusted his calculations, lowered the temperature of Sirius B to only 8,000 Kelvin, and changed its spectral class without any apparent justification to F0. This would enable him to lower his predicted redshift to only 20 to 25 kilometers per second as the most likely value in perfect agreement with Adams's measurement. Speaking of agreement with Eddington, Adams would write, although such a degree of agreement can only be regarded as accidental for observations as difficult as these, the inherent accord of the measurements made by different methods, and in particular with the registering microphotometer, is thoroughly satisfactory. The results may be considered, therefore, as affording direct evidence from stellar spectra for the validity of the third test of the theory of general relativity, and for the remarkable densities predicted by Eddington for the dwarf stars of early type of spectrum. In reality, nothing could be further from the truth. Here is how Hallberg put it. The original Adams measurement was too small by nearly a factor of four. Had this been apparent at the time, the Sirius B result surely would have been used as strong evidence against general relativity rather than in support of it. He goes on, It is ironic that the original observational measurement of Sirius B redshift and the theoretical prediction that prompted it were both in error, and that the errors were such that they conspired to produce astonishingly good agreement. What is even more surprising is that, within a few years, Moore published a paper exactly agreeing with Adams relative to the gravitational redshift of Sirius B. That paper, of course, was also an error. 
In it, Moore claimed that between four and nine separate lines could be used to measure the gravitational redshift of Sirius B. Unfortunately, his sample included lines from Sirius A, since the companion has no metal lines. As a result, most of the lines measured by Moore did not even belong to Sirius B. Moore had only a 36-inch reflector at his disposal, while Adams had used the 100-inch reflector on Mount Wilson. Nonetheless, Moore did correct Eddington's idea that Sirius B was an F-zero class star and argued for much higher temperatures, somewhere between A3 and A5. There are lessons to be learned from all this. First, all the lines of hydrogen did not behave the same way, as must be the case if gravitational redshift results were to be taken seriously. Second, watch out for the shifts of metallic lines. They must also confirm the shifts obtained from the hydrogen bomber lines. And third, there appears to be problems with establishing a temperature for Sirius B. The sad part about all this was the fact that Adams' measurement would dominate astrophysical thought for the next 45 years. In the meantime, in 1954, Daniel Popper would report a gravitational redshift for another famous white dwarf, 40 Iridani B. I reproduce his table 3 below. Note how he manipulated his data to get the redshift he wanted. He lowered the weight on hydrogen delta and hydrogen beta and increased the weight for his hydrogen gamma results. No wonder he got the 20 kilometers per second answer he sought. The redshift of Iridiani B was measured again in 1972 by Greenstein and Trimble. This time I could find no problems with the measurements except one. It was clear that the spectroscopic lines for hydrogen alpha and hydrogen beta were made of two components with the core and broader wings. So now we are potentially dealing with two hydrogen pools in exchange with one another, something well observed in spectroscopy laboratories on Earth and a sign that chemical coordination might indeed be involved. Here is a quote from that paper. The high dispersion image tube plates revealed an unexpected feature in hydrogen alpha and hydrogen beta. The profiles had the broad wings typical of white dwarfs, but there was also sharp cores superposed. Our measures placed the core somewhat less than or equal to 0.02 angstrom to the red of the centroid of the wings. The red shift of Sirius B would not be measured again after Adams and Moore until this paper appeared in 1971. By then, all of astronomy had come to accept that white dwarfs were ultra-dense, and Chandra Shekhar was already famous for his degeneracy arguments which had solved Eddington's problem and prevented the white dwarf from further collapse. There are several interesting aspects of the Greenfield et al. paper. First, the use of model atmosphere now comes into play with knowledge of the mass of Sirius B given from dynamic studies. Such model atmospheres were used at the time to estimate effective temperatures between 29,000 and 33,000 Kelvin and logs of surface gravity of 8 to 8.8. .8. Greenstein et al. used model atmospheres and their data to obtain the following. T effective equals 32,000 plus or minus 1,000 Kelvin log of g equals 8.65 and r equals 0.0078 plus or minus 0.0002 of the radius of the sun. All of these numbers in the end are dependent on assuming an emissivity of 1 for the dwarf as did Eddington in deriving his mass luminosity relation. Importantly however the authors note that if they concentrated only on the hydrogen gamma line then they would obtain a temperature of only 9,800 Kelvin, resulting in a radius of 0.023 of the radius of the Sun, and a redshift of only 28 kilometers per second. As a consequence, they discounted the hydrogen gamma and obtained a redshift of 81 plus or minus 16 using only the hydrogen beta and hydrogen alpha lines. The problem, of course, is that all spectroscopic lines must have exactly the same redshifts if the cause is to be assigned to relativity. The fact that the hydrogen gamma line does not comply clearly indicates that these shifts might have little to do with general relativity. It is much more probable that real chemical interactions are taking place on the star and that these, in fact, are responsible in large part both for the broadening and the shifting of individual lines. In order to get an appreciation of the state of astronomy in this period, 
Let us have a look at another paper by Greenstein and Trimble in which they have attempted to determine the gravitational redshift of 210 white dwarfs. From this analysis, they end up selecting out 53 stars, or only about one quarter of the entire data set. The rest of the stars are discarded with these words. The low yield of usable velocities clearly demonstrates the difficulty of the problem. In the abstract, they highlight Systematic wavelength shifts of helium-1 lines in dB stars make their velocity more negative than those of dA stars. Similar negative shifts may exist for metallic lines. In the text they write, We should not be surprised by huge errors. Differences between velocities given by two plates of the same star may on occasion exceed 100 kilometers per second. Wow! They go on. Usually hydrogen beta, hydrogen gamma, hydrogen delta, hydrogen epsilon, hydrogen zeta are used. Hydrogen beta, because of its location on the decreasing density slope at the end of the spectrum, is often systematically in error and must be discarded. And again, hydrogen beta is therefore given low weight or discarded. And again, the lines measured by VT, a person, were weighted equally, except for hydrogen beta, which, when accordant, was given half weight, but otherwise zero weight. What they are saying is that if they liked the result from hydrogen beta, they kept that result in the data set, but if they subjectively did not like it, then the result was discarded. Remember that four years later, Greenstein et al. would use the hydrogen beta line to obtain the gravitational redshift of Sirius B and would throw out the hydrogen gamma line. Greenstein and Trimble are aware that their data set may contain huge errors, Still, they report an average gravitational redshift in the final analysis of about 50 plus or minus 5 kilometers per second for the stars included and conclude. In general, the mean redshift derived is well enough determined to establish the reality of Einstein's gravitational shift and the magnitude of the gravitational potential in the layers forming the hydrogen line. Of course, that statement can only be made if one assumes that hydrogen and helium experience no effects of chemical coordination on the star, something which they can never exclude. In fact, they themselves were aware of the following. Collisions of helium plus X often displaces lines of the element X to the violet. They go on to write, In case the atmospheres of metallic line white dwarfs contain helium rather than hydrogen, the broadening and the shift theory will be grossly different than for a hydrogen-rich star. Only DA stars, that is, those showing only hydrogen bomber lines, can at present be used for quantitative evaluation of the gravitational shift. But Greenstein has already shown us that the hydrogen gamma line on Sirius B has a redshift which is only about a quarter that obtained from either hydrogen alpha or gamma. For stars that do not contain only hydrogen, all metallic lines must also produce the same gravitational redshift. But we will see in the next video that this is not the case. The problem of redshifted lines in white dwarfs is extremely interesting. But again, astrophysics has not considered all the possibilities. Instead of abandoning their thermodynamically false theory, they chose to redesign the stars and invoke ultra-dense objects. In this regard, consider what is more radical, a super dense object or a lowered emissivity. In the laboratory, there is no evidence for the first and ample evidence for the second. In the end, the question is much more complex than initially believed. Scientists have been much too quick to channel all their thoughts down the concept that white dwarfs were incredibly dense. The problem is that while hydrogen lines are indeed redshifted, not all bomber lines are equally redshifted. In the next video, we will cover the modern redshift measurements of Sirius B and other stars. When white dwarfs possess spectroscopic lines from other elements, none of these lines are redshifted to the same degree. In fact, some lines are blue shifted. What a headache for astrophysics. Unable to account for insufficient redshifts or even blue shifts from non-hydrogen elements, astronomers have insisted that all the lines which pose problems do not in fact originate from the surface of the dwarf. According to them, these lines must come from accretion disks beyond the dwarf or must be blue shifted due to radiative levitation. 
By displacing the origin of these lines, they avoid the theoretical dilemma that the lines provide. Well, that is all for today. We will return to the white dwarf and to modern measurements of redshifts of Sirius B in the next presentation. So if you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the videos to your friends and to your local astronomy club, support me with a like and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below and I'll see you soon on the next video.